well, let me get the show on the road. I love the energy in the room. It's really great. It's a pity that we couldn't all be together. So, so for everyone here, uh, just where we are today and what we're doing, um, for all our participants, it's great. We've got people from all over the world here. I'm seeing people from that I recognize from South Africa. I'm seeing people from the UK. I'm seeing people from Switzerland. I'm seeing people from the US and Florida and even some see this someone from Texas. Um, so the reason why we pulled this together is, is you know, we, we, we've been in the industry in the US for a year, but we've been in this property management industry for almost two decades now. And um, we often find that when there is a bump in the market, people go back to, to statistics and reports and figures and graphs. Um, and there's a lot of that around. I mean, you can read about the pandemic and the influence of it everywhere. But um, we decided to tap into experience because we think it makes a, a bigger difference because the people that we've got on the call, I mean, you can just hear in the last couple of minutes, these are people that have been in the industry for a long time, but have seen crisis come and go. Um, and it's wonderful to be able to tap into experience to talk to our, our constituent base to say, guys, just ask questions. How do you get through this? Because the easiest thing to do in a pandemic is just to go not do anything. And, and we really just met so many people in the last couple of months. Just go, look, I just want to wait. I just want to sit still. I don't want to do anything. I mean, at some point, you've got to get over that. At some point, you've got to move on and say, well, I've still got a business to run. Um, and that's why we pulled today together. So. Um, I have to do this disclaimer, the lawyer says I have to, so I'm indemnifying everyone on this call that just says we're not lawyers, no, no one on this call that I know of is a lawyer. Um, so just if you, if you see anything that you go, you know, get legal advice, don't ask us for legal advice, this is purely just tapping to a decades and decades and decades worth of experience to, to get a perspective on how you move on from a crisis, how do you actually keep on building your business and not focus on the crisis and focus on the pandemic, but actually focus on your business. I'm only gonna show you two slides on paper and this is just who we are because I always find people go, who are you and where do you come from and what credibility do you have to, to pull something like this together? We've been around since 2004. Um, we headquartered in the United Kingdom and we're fairly new in the US. We've only been here for a year. Um, we process about 3 billion US dollars a year in residential rentals. Um, and what makes it just unique is how we do it because we don't just provide people with software but we actually provide them with banking and integrated accounting that links to the software which means that we need to partner with some really stand-up banks in the world. So we, in the US, have just partnered with Bank of America, the second largest bank. We've been partnering with Bank United in Florida, which is the 63rd largest bank in the US. And then all over, we've partnered with really, really great banks like Credit Suisse and Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, but it's because what we do is different. We don't just provide you with the traditional clunky software. We provide you with an actual banking solution to property management. And then we've partnered with some really cool clients across the world. We do some stuff with Keller Williams, Sotheby's, Century 21, Remax, brands you, you, you'd recognize. Just the, one last thing to understand about us is, is that we're a very different company in, in our, our DNA and where we come from. We actually started as a non-governmental organization or as a charity don or a donor base where we said we want to enable people to give um, to charitable causes around the world. So give and gain... Um, a nonprofit arm was formed before the property vertical that we work in and was all about allowing people like you and me to, to raise funds for good courses around the world. And the big difference between this and other fundraising sites that you get is that we curate the causes. So we actually make sure that the cause that you're giving to is a registered cause that's legitimate and that is checked out. So you know your money goes to a good place and that all that giving is done transparently. So if you, if you feel that you want to give and you feel that you want to get into raising funds for good causes, Give and Gain is the place to go. Go have a look at it and you'll see we've partnered with some really amazing charities there. But it's the heart and the DNA of our business. Um, just we, we practice what we preach in the sense that we even give our staff a day a month to raise funds for any of these causes um, at our cost. So, But enough of that. I want to get into today because I want to, I want to just talk about the outline of the session and then I want to get it going is, is that it's really all about how do I now take this next step in my business. A lot of people have said either one of two things to me that I've spoken to that either said the effects of the pandemic will stay with our business forever because my clients have chosen to do business with me in a different manner going forward and I need to factor that in. So that's smart forward thinking people that go, I need to make changes because the environment has changes and a change and the change feels permanent. And then we get other people that I'm concerned about that go, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm gonna wait for this to blow over. Um, and we just wanted to get a perspective on how to deal with uncertainty and how to deal with change. So I am going to hand over to Stefan. Now Stefan is an experienced business person that is both in, he's got this foot in the charitable world and his foot into the business world. And Stefan's got a wealth of experience and a massive amount of insight. He's one of the directors of Paper Up in the US. And he's an advisor to us. He's a person that I go to if I need advice. So I thought, what is the best place to start if we want to give clients advice and that would 
always be starting off with Stefan. So Stefan, I'm gonna just introduce you and stop sharing the slide and then you take it away. Thank you, thank you, Lope, thank very, very much. I'm honored to be a part of this. So um, I was uh, just, uh, just before this, um, a friend called me and I said, well, I've gotta get off because I've gotta get on a webinar. And he said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm gonna present, um, talking about how to manage life in chaos. And he goes, well, you're good at that because you create chaos and then you manage your own chaos. And so uh, you can tell he's a good friend of mine. And, uh, and I don't know if he's true about that, but you know, my specialty has more to do with um, dealing with people. Now, that has sort of been my background. Uh, my father was a, a, a psychologist, and so I grew up under the umbrella of a shrink and uh, for many years thought, you know, maybe I would do that, but uh, decided to do some other things. So as Lo just said, I'm involved in the charitable space as well as in the business space and uh, many, many uh, friends and colleagues and, and people that I know of um, that I have utmost respect for um, that know how to navigate these very, very uncharted waters. Um, I sit on a few boards, both profit and nonprofit. So you get to observe people, you get to observe best in class, you get to observe what happens when there's a disaster, you get to observe um, people managing well, people managing not so well. Um, and that is a, a bit of what we'll talk about here today. So let me take a few moments and um, just uh, share a few thoughts. And I know we have a wonderful panel and, and I think we will uh, in the next uh, hour and 15 minutes or so come away knowing perhaps something we didn't know uh, or perhaps being reminded or affirmed of something that you knew but uh, somehow let lay dormant in your brain. Sometimes it needs to be activated in this place. And I love the theme um, of what PayProp's putting on today, this idea of, of navigating through uncertainty. And I think, Lo, you're exactly right. So often in those times, uh, we tend to do nothing and uh, the, the proverbial head in the sand. And uh, usually that is not a good solution whatsoever. So um, back in 1972, and if you're under the age of 40, you probably will not remember this, but um, uh, the biggest grossing film of 1972 was a movie called The Poseidon Adventure. Uh, there has been some remakes of it, but there was a series of films during the early 70s that had to do with disaster. There was a movie called The Towering Inferno. There was a movie called Earthquake. There was a series of movies called Airport um, and had to do with all kinds of disasters that happen on airplanes and airports. Um, but the one I want to pick on is the, uh, the original, The Poseidon Adventure. And uh, if you haven't seen the movie, it's, it's worth a, a watch because uh, uh, you'll see some classic old actors. Many of them have gone. Um, but as I said, it was the biggest grossing film of the year. And the basic premise of that film was a bunch of people got on this beautiful ocean liner that was um, heading out on its uh, last voyage, going from New York over to the Mediterranean, and uh, then it was going to be scrapped. And so the, the journey begins with people in a very festive mood. Um, it's New Year's. They're excited to be on this luxury ocean liner. If you've ever had the opportunity to do something like that, there's, there's just sort of an excitement in the air. And... Uh, as they're celebrating and having their dinners and their parties and so on, um, there's a major earthquake that happens under the water and it creates a tsunami. And that, uh, that tsunami creates a tidal wave and uh, unbeknownst to the passengers, that ship is hit. And as a result, it capsizes. So it turns upside down. So imagine a major cruise liner turned upside down. And uh, the rest of the movie is what happens um, to the passengers Obviously, many die. There's a few that survive. Um, and as I was thinking about that, for some reason, I was thinking how interesting would have a parallel. If you were to go back a year today, um, back at Christmas 2019, thinking of New Year's Eve 2020, I don't think any of us had the idea at all that we were going to be heading into what we have all experienced as this global pandemic we did know we were going into an election year. We did, did know it was going to probably be somewhat toxic. Um, but other than that, we were clueless um, as to what the year had. Here in South Florida, uh, we were excited about the Super Bowl, which is a big 
uh, a big experience. Uh, we had a lot of things happening here in this community, and we were expecting a wonderful 2020. Imagine being on the ocean liner, crossing the sea, very excited. Then there's an earthquake. In fact, there's several earthquakes occur, and there's several tidal waves, and next thing you know, our lives are turned upside down. And uh, everything that you thought, you had to rethink. What was upside was now, uh, um, you know, what was upside down is now right side up. And um, you think about uh, what you do in those particular circumstances and not to belabor the point of the movie, but the basic premise is there's a, there's a small group of people, um, ironically led by a, a, a pastor, a priest, who decides to take a lead the people and say, look, we can't just stay here because we will all drown. We must go to the hull. In other words, everything that was upside down is now right side up. And we must go to the engine room where the steel is less thick. And that's the best chance of us surviving is if we make our way there. And uh, four or five, six people agreed with them. But the vast majority of people said, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to stay put. We're going to do nothing. We're going to wait till people come and rescue. And he pleaded with everybody, he says, you will all die unless you do something. And, uh, and he pleaded and pleaded and, and uh, they ignored him. And uh, so therefore, the rest of the movie is their adventure. And eventually, a handful of them escape and survive. And um, I thought about that in what we're doing. And uh, the vast majority of people in times of crisis you know, as you well know, and, and we're all susceptible to do the same thing, um, is that we become paralyzed. Sometimes there is that wait and see. You don't want to react too fast, but on the only hand, you know, you're afraid that uh, maybe any reaction will be a uh, poor reaction, and you'll look back and say, I should not have done that. However, at the same time, in everything that we've experienced uh, here in the last eight months, and obviously this thing is not over, and uh, various economists and various people are saying, you know, this will be several years in the making as we sort of unwind. We recognize that there has been some good things and then not so good things that have happened in this thing. So the question is, as a person, an individual, as you think about leading, you think about leading in your own, in your own world, you think of your family, you think of your marriage, you think of your friends, you think of your community, but also you think about your career. Uh, many of us have spent uh, decades developing relationships, developing reputations, developing a platform, developing a career. Uh, many of us have an identity wrapped around our career. And then the tsunami hits. And next thing we know, our world is upside down. And uh, as you well know, many people have been taken out. There are people that have lost everything. There are people that have lost significant wealth. There's people who lost uh, multi-generational businesses. They've lost their careers, those kinds of things. And then there have been those that we've all watched and we have been mesmerized by their leadership, by their courage, by their ability to say, you know, I'm not going to buy into the group think. And while everybody might be deciding to stay in the ballroom and waiting to be rescued, we're going to go find the escape route. We're going to take a chance and we're going to take the courage to go do something that maybe others think is, is absolutely crazy. But part of being a leader is a little bit of being a leader. Um, John Maxwell says, uh, as an author and a speaker on leadership, says something very interesting. He goes, leaders uh, see things before everybody else sees things. And therefore, so many times, um, uh, not only do they see things, but they know things. In other words, there's a sense of, I, I think this is the way we need to go. And you're not necessarily encouraged by your peers. In fact, sometimes the most unique leaders are the ones that are outliers in terms of their leadership. And, and I want to paint a picture of three different types of characteristics um, that I think you can apply in your own life in whatever way you want to, whether it's in your own personal life. So many times, what happens in our personal life cascades into our professional life. If your personal life is a disaster, uh, it's really hard to be at your best um, in your professional life and vice versa. But uh, I wanna paint three sort of characters. I think in pictures, I think in metaphor, so I apologize that, but uh, that's, that's the way I'm wired. Um, but I wanna paint these three characters. One is the athlete. When you think about an athlete, um, there's many things you can sort of focus in on. What, what creates an athlete? What wires an athlete? What makes an athlete different? Um, but I want to just highlight two things. And I, one is their training. 
the fact that an athlete, those of you that have a hobby, those of you that cycle, those of you that swim, those of you that look back and maybe in your earlier years and maybe you played for a, a university of some sort, uh, whatever it is, there's tremendous amount of training that goes in to being an athlete. Um, I know people that are triathletes. Uh, they do Ironman, for example. And the amount of training and the amount of discipline and the amount of sacrifice, they sacrifice in their diet, they sacrifice in their time. But the focus on training is so, so important. I don't know about you, but there's many times that I've spent a lot of time uh, in on something without seeing the fruit. And you're in, in every day, you're, you're working on something, you're training on something. And sometimes you just want to give up because you go, why am I doing this? Because I'm not seeing the fruit of it. Um, I've been told that there will be fruit, but I've yet to see the fruit. It's not until you actually have the day of the event, the day of the experience that you benefit from the training. It's not until that tsunami hits and not until everything is upside down that then you've resort to what you've been training for and you realize I've been training all my life for this moment, for such a time as this. The other thing about an athlete is integrity. You know, an athlete has to compete in, within the rules. You know, and we live in a culture right now where I think that's a differentiator. If you're a man or a woman of integrity, um, if you're a man or a woman that's humble, if you're a man or a woman that thinks win-win, you will uh, stand out. Um, narcissism is on its way out, um, especially as we think about you know, competing with others. Um, you start looking at who do you want to actually do business with? But the beauty of an athlete, I mean, we've all seen the horror stories of the athlete that does not compete within the rules. We think of cyclists that have been doping. We think of marathon runners that cut corners. We think of people that have been expelled and cut out games because they didn't go according to the rules. And so therefore integrity, especially in this space, especially in what we do is critically important. So training and integrity under the umbrella of an athlete. And you can take your time and think of other characteristics that, that could portray an athlete. The second character that I would encourage you to look at is the, the, the farmer. Now, we don't live in a, in a farming community. Some of you perhaps grew up in a farming community. Some of you that are part of other, uh, as we have people from all over the world, you, you may have more affinity as you think about the farming community. Um, here in the United States, we have vast portions of our country that are devoted completely to farming. And uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to point to the, to the farmer. One is their faithfulness. Another word is their steadfastness. A farmer consistently does the work of a farmer. They get up early, they plow the field, they prepare the crops, they, they harvest the crops, whether it's good weather, bad weather. Uh, they, they have seasons of plenty, and they have seasons of famine. But if you've ever met a farmer or a family that owns a farm or a conglomerate owns a farm, there is this steadfastness that is built in. It's part of the DNA. And as we lead through this particular times, uh, the, the importance of steadfastness, faithfulness. Um, I have a, a saying that I love. It's an old Nietzsche saying, but it says a long obedience in the same direction, meaning that you focus your attention on something. Maybe it's in your own marriage. Maybe it's your role as a father or a mother or as a friend. You know, you think about your career, but the idea of being faithful, being steadfast, people can look at you and say, I can count on you, especially during disasters, especially during the tsunami. When that wave hits and everything's upside down and people's lives are tossed, they look to you many ways as a compass. And if you're steadfast and you're faithful, you will attract good talent. The other thing about a farmer is innovation thinking creatively. This is one of the reasons I love Payprop. And when I first met them and heard about their vision and heard about the work they're doing, I was intrigued because not only was I impressed with the culture of the organization and its leaders, but I was also very intrigued by its innovation. Um, its idea to look at something and be able to say, how can we do this better? And I would encourage all of us as we think about our careers and we think of our, about our work, um, we are forced to think differently. We're working from home more than we've ever had. We've had to think differently. We've had to get better at things like Zoom and, and webinars. Um, we've had to navigate through how do you create community with your team when you can't actually be together in your team? Um, how do you stay in touch with your clients? How do you get new clients during a time when nobody wants to meet or it's hard to meet? Innovation, 
how do we do what we do? I go back to the Poseidon adventure, that wonderful movie, but you know, the, the gentleman that was leading this small group to their rescue, they had to be incredibly innovative on how they did. Last but not least is the soldier. We've talked about the athlete, we've talked about the farmer, and now it's the soldier. There's a, many things under the umbrella of a soldier, but I would say there's, there's two things that I would like to highlight uh, this morning. What is the discipline of a soldier? A soldier is incredibly focused. What we do requires discipline. I don't know about you, but I've had to become more disciplined in this year than I've ever had before. There's too many distractions. Um, especially if you're working from home or, or everything that has been normal. Many of us, you know, did a lot of traveling. Many of us, the way we did business was different. And all of a sudden now, we've had to become disciplined. We've, I've had to ask myself, what's important? What's not important? Where do I need to be focusing my attention right now? You know, how do you create better efficiencies? Um, where do you draw things closer? Where do you let things loose? Um, how do you navigate these things? But think of a soldier as highly disciplined. If any of you have ever been in the military or have family members in the military, you know, a young man or a young woman enters into the military and they're undisciplined. Their character is undisciplined. They're physically, uh, for the most part, undisciplined. And through a series of training and through a series of experiences, they become highly disciplined and, and highly focused. The second thing is courage. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm guessing you've had to uh, find some courage that you didn't have before. If you watch too much news, uh, if you read every article on the internet, if you indulge in every conspiracy theory, all of a sudden you think that the end of the world's coming and, uh, and that becomes uh, something that paralyzes us because you figure, well, what's the difference? You know, what, what, am I, what is it that I'm doing that's gonna make a big difference? And this is the temptation to just decide to sit on the sidelines. And however, uh, it is the mistake that we can all make. We must have courage in times like this. This is what a leader does. This is what, uh, if you wanna get ahead, if you wanna take ground, if you wanna look back at this season and go, that was my finest hour. That was our finest hour. That is when we did what we did really, really well. I've said that I don't wanna just get through this, I want to ace this. I want to do excellent work. I want to look back and go, you know what? During the hurricane, during the pandemic, during the earthquake, during the tsunami, during the tidal wave, when everything was turned upside down, that is when I, we led incredibly well. So just a quick reminder, as a word picture, think of that athlete, the athlete that trains, sacrifices, and in order to train, to aim for a prize, that athlete that has integrity, follows the rules, um, becomes exceptional at understanding the rules and how to use the rules to their advantage. Think about the farmer who is faithful and steadfast as they deliver, uh, whether it's raining, whether it's snowing, whether it's sleet, whether it's famine, whether it's harvest. They're incredibly innovative because they've got to do more with less and think about that soldier who is highly trained um, in their uh, discipline and in their focus um, and the courage it takes to often do things that others don't want to do. Uh, while everybody's running from the fire, you're running to the fire. While everybody's running away from the disaster, you're running to the disaster. And so in those thoughts, um, I want to encourage you. I think we're in for a great morning. And I want to encourage you that um, you and I all have an opportunity to differentiate ourselves in, um, in the way that we do what we do. And uh, hopefully some of these things are applicable, applicable to your life and, uh, and maybe can make a difference. So again, appreciate the honor. I'm a big fan of PayProp. Thank you, Lo, for the invitation and uh, always available here to help. And God bless you all. Stefan, that is that is quite the opening there. I mean, for, for anyone to start a session like this was going, you know, it's all about training and integrity and steadfastness and discipline and courage. I mean, we've been used to hearing so many other things about the situation that we're in. And 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 that is beautiful. It's beautiful because it touches on on how as a leader you you, you get through a crisis. Thank you. M Mike, can can I switch over to you? I mean, Mike, you you run a massive business in South Florida. You you run one of the largest real estate firms in South Florida. You've got two, just over 2,000 people working in your business. That's a massive responsibility that you shoulder. Um, 
you've you've had to to power through this. Well, how did you do that? What did you do that was different? Because you've, I mean, we've just spoke just before the session started and you're saying it's really going well. You really did well. Yeah, so, so how did you, what did you do that's different? A little, they talk about a K economy. We're basically on the K that's going up. And I know there's a lot of people in the tourism and the retail and hospitality that are not doing so well. So um, we are blessed and we are fortunate. We thank the good Lord. But if I look back and just to kind of pivot from what Stefan said, it reminds me of um, Patrick Lezioni's book, um, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. I don't know if anybody's read that, but I think that he was kind of leading that. And if I look back on what we did in March and where we were, if uh, just to refresh you, um, the first thing that the book says that you need is trust. It really says if you don't have trust, he goes the negative side, but I'll give you the positive side. If you don't have trust amongst your team, you're not going to be able to deliver the goods. And I think we, as an organization, have been transparent. There was another quote that um, one of our past managers just sent me um, the other day. He's with another firm. He moved to Pittsburgh. He was getting a divorce, and um, and there was a tr it was a coach um, that was um, that that plays for the Kentucky basketball team, John Calipari, and he says without trust people are both timid and selfish. So let me say, without trust, people are timid and selfish. So let me finish that thought process. This gentleman that no longer works for us, he says, I can't think of a timid Kai's manager. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the point being is he was saying we have trust. And so therefore we were able to do. So what did we do at that time? We, so let me finish out the five dysfunctions. I'll come back. So first is trust. And, if you, and it takes transparency, it takes openness, it takes um, understanding people's personalities, as, as, um, as Stefan mentioned. But then it says, which was difficult for me as a young man, I had a hard father, I'm an SOB, the son of the broker, not the I mean, son of the boss, and, so, um, and he was tough. And so I always was trying to be easier, but what I learned and avoid conflict, and what the book says is you have to have conflict because if you don't challenge each other and if you don't fight it out and wrestle and, and understand, you then don't get commitment and agreement by all. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the dilemma. If you're quieter, if you, if you don't address the issues, if you don't flush the problems out, if you don't fight and, and challenge each other and, and, and sometimes you know, get into a wrestling like you did with your siblings as young kids and wrestle and, and kind of fight, you're not then going to flush out the issues. And once you do all that and you walk through that process, then you can get to an agreement. You can get to a you know contract. You can say, get to an understanding of where you're going and, and move forward. And then once you get that agreement, then you can move the other two results in, which is the fourth point, which is accountability, because we've all agreed to what we're doing. We've all agreed to where we're going. We've all agreed now because we trust, we fought it out, we did this, and then you finally get the results. So, so if I look back at our five, I mean, um, the March Dale, we already had the trust component and we called everybody in together and we said, look, this, we've been through 08, this is disastrous. We're gonna make cuts and we're gonna make cuts hard and fast. And by April 1st, we laid people off, we cut people down, we, we went into a really hard mode, I mean, two weeks into it, because we thought when we looked at it, we did our understanding, we wrestled through it, that we said, this is going to be severe. And it was. I mean, the business dropped 38% in the second quarter um, of our quarter. Now, that's disastrous. If you lose 38% of your revenue in one quarter, you're, you're, no one's making those type of profits. I mean, the business they normally say makes about a 5% profit on the normal. If you're not technology, you guys are probably making a lot more. But, the, um, but, but businesses that are dealing with people in business and production, so a 38% would send you down. And so I do think the second thing that we did is we moved to communicate. We sent out three videos immediately to try to calm everybody down, to try to say everything's going to be okay. We've been through this before. And, and I was doing videos on my, on my phone now and sending them out. And then my daughter pretty soon thereafter says, let's just do a town hall meeting. 
And so since that period of time, we, we get a couple thousand, we actually have 3,600 associates. We did about $6 million oh, in home sales. So I'll give you a little sense of it. But the, um, um, so we, we have a town hall meeting every week at Friday at two o'clock. Now, I don't want to do it anymore once the business, so the second quarter was down 38%. And then obviously the third quarter was up 15% and the fourth quarter is up about 16%. But we're, so we're for the year, pretty much the industry real estate in the United States is comes back to about a flat level. It'll be up in units um, basically against last year's 2019, but we'll be up more in price because we've seen such a low demand. So so then you think, and then let me just give you some more shift. We, we had already had the fundamentals in place for, tech, for the technological. So if you go back, I'll give you two more things. Is you talk about vision and, the, and, the, and he talked about the athlete. The athlete has a vision for a goal. He or she is training for this prize. And, and, and they want to, and so that work and that effort that that, tr that athlete is doing, and the, and the farmer, the same thing. He or she is looking for that, you know, uh, that, that harvest. You know, we just had Thanksgiving, and, and for you that are on the U.S., I mean, a great harvest at the first, the pilgrims that came over because they got their abundance. They were starving, and they, and they finally figured it out. So, so I think if you as a leader don't have a clear vision for your business and what you're trying to accomplish, then it is not gonna happen. You, by all means, against all others, have to have a passion, have to have a clear vision, have to have a fight that you're gonna accomplish that. And so we, as a company, saw the technology that was changing and had been building platforms previously to this that, that were in place that then helped us accelerate those decisions. So we moved into, no one likes to be on Zoom. And, we, and we, again, we went into Zoom mode. We went into weekly meetings with all of our management team, you know, and we still have them every other week. Um, and we have hours meetings that are, are brainstorming, talking through strategies and issues. We're doing strategic planning right now for the first quarter. We just, and we're figuring out, what, and our theme for next year is going to be connect, engage, because again, trying to connect with people and engage with people has been harder. So how can we do that in the new mode? And then the last tag on that, connect, engage, and have fun in 21 because no one's had fun in 20. So we said, darn it, we're going to have fun in 21. So, so how did we connect and engage? So we, we brought on video experts, how to be able to communicate. We brought on counselors to our management team with Stefan and his non-charitable. We brought on a wellness, um, 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 wellness center with therapists saying, how do you overcome strain and stress and isolation? And what can we do to help the people? We put our managers said, you, we, they, they each have about a hundred. We have about 50 offices. You know, they said about three, 3,500 associates. So each manager has about 70 associates or so. And we said, you need to be calling five and 10 a day. You need to be reaching out because they're not coming in. So to be intentional on our connections and our communications. We went virtual on our training. I mean, we, we pivoted totally. We shut everybody down, our whole IT. Everybody started working at home. And so um, we were able to move and move everybody technologically to a virtual space that we're still probably running at now. Today, as we speak, we brought in a ninja selling seminar, which was a face-to-face selling seminar that the people have to pay for that we went back to the vendor on direct selling and said look we can't do face to face what can you do and they said well you can buy a, a weekly or monthly program so at the end of this year we have four webinars today seven right now as we're speaking 750 of our associates are on this webinar and um and if this finishes i'll get on the end of it and then we have one next week we have one at the beginning of the year. Um, and so we just, again, adapted and changed, went to, we partnered with Matterport. Matterport, everybody knows 3D and we're doing deals. There, it was out there, but we gave our people a platform. They could, with their phone, um, shoot the house 
and then basically upload a 3D option. We gave them social media, um, libraries and, and, and JPEGs and programs that through agent icon. So we went out and found tools and technology that we said now the, the whole world's on social media. We have e-signature. So pretty much our associates, I'm a little worried because we've got a couple hundred thousand square feet of office space. I'm not so sure they're coming back and I don't know what I'm gonna do by paying that rent. And, and our own in the buildings, but but we basically have put an ecosystem in place. We did ad works where we responded and retargeted all the leads that came back in. We went to an AI platform. So so I think we moved very aggressively and communicated very intentionally. And I think in my sense, um, that was work. Just to give you even the sense, we don't have the awards meeting. So to our top 250 people, we sent wreaths and um, holiday gifts, you know what I mean? So right now we, we went through, we, and, we, and we went through it. We sent everybody for Thanksgiving because business had picked up. I hand all of our employees, we have about 250 employees, handwritten thank you note, and we gave them $500 and we gave our management $1,000 because the business had picked back up. So again, connecting, focused in on our people, trying to support them in the best way we can, figuring out the strategies that we need to do, and then do actionable items um, to be able to execute accordingly. So I can keep going on, but I think that gives you a little Mike, bit of a sense. That is incredible. I mean, the fact, I mean, people forget, I mean, you're planning for 2021. Most people just want to put their heads in the sand and pretend this year didn't happen. And you've, you've transformed an entire business in the middle of this pandemic. Right. I mean, how much of this do you think is going to stick? Uh, b b because I think I mean, I, like I said, I mean, we're we're. Um, I think that all of it. I mean, I think that people have become accustomed to doing virtual business. I mean, I walked into an office just, to, and we got an international board here. I haven't. When I do those Facebook lives, uh, town hall meetings, I go to a branch, and and then highlight the people in the branch and kind of show what they're doing. And in the branch that I went to last Friday. There was a person born from Israel, a person from Brazil, a person from Colombia, a person from Germany. So we in South Florida live in an international um, play, but they were telling me they're getting clients that they're sending properties to walking through Facebook Live and the owner, the buyers aren't even coming and they're making offers and buying properties. So I think it's transformed dramatically. Now you still need the inspections, you still need the systems, you need the mortgage and title. We have all that packed up into one system. But um, no, I think Zoom, I think it's more efficient. I think that you're finding you can do more effectively. I still like the engagement, but I think you've got to recreate how to, we're having an awards meeting. Um, we, we usually have 1,000, 1,500 people there. And now we're saying we're going to go into small groups and, and maybe five and 10 people in a large place to be able to hand recognize. Now, is that a lot more work on our part? I actually, you, you talk about 3,500 associates. I, when we were smaller, when we were 1,000 agents, when my father was involved, I started writing birthday cards to every agent and to everybody. So now there's three, I don't know if you know the math, but, but basically it's, it's 300 a month. It's, it's 10 a day. And so, you know what I mean? So I, I get, well, here, I mean, they're right. Well, you're just joking about it. Here they are. You know what I mean? They sit on my desk and, and this is this, this is it. And so I send them out, but that's the connection and that's our culture. And so again, clear vision to say, we care about our associates. How much can we help them grow and do more business but they're part of the family. And then lastly is the giving. And I'll just I'll wrap that up. Is um, So in the pandemic, through Stefan, who does a lot of charity work, we had a member of ours that was in a restaurant business. And he has a sushi maki restaurant business. And he got nailed. And he was closed down. And he came back and said, I can do a meal for $5, I think. I don't remember what it was exactly, Stefan. And I can give chicken and rice and we can deliver it. And so we went to our offices and said, where is the need? And in our homestead office, schools were closed down and the poorest people, they have to go get food at the schools. And so we went to the schools and said, we'll deliver a thousand meals to the kids. And so we then funded that. Our office went over there. Our people went over there and did that. We went into Liberty City, which is a, a poor area through a church that we were involved with. And we said, what about your members? 
and you know, I mean, your members aren't working and they were maybe in the travel and hospitality. And then for four Sundays in a row after church, we brought meals to the congregation and to the community. So I do think today we're doing a feed for the hungry. Um, we've said to our associates, you benefit it. You're, you're stronger. Who would have figured the last six months has been better than you thought. And so we're matching the dollars and saying, um, we're going to give to a food bank because we do think there is a secondary group that isn't benefiting as much as the real estate does. So I think you need to give back to the community. You need to be part of the community. And, um, and then you need to really care about those that work for you and then give them the vision and the hope to be able to execute. Well, Mike, that is, that is, that is incredible. It, it, it provides also a nice leading for me for, for, for Rudy. Now, those of you who don't know Rudy Guerta, he's the founder of Better Bond, which is bond origination business in South Africa. But, but, but the thing about Rudy is that's not just all he does. He's got this network of businesses that he's involved in. And we thought there's no one better to talk about the complexity that gets created from this disconnection. I mean, Mike's talked a lot about how do I connect? How do I keep my people together? How do I, how do, I do all of that? I mean, really, you've got a particular challenge because it's not just one business that you run. You run a couple of businesses. You're involved in a ton of things. Um, how do you keep it together? Yeah, hello, hello. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk a bit. Um, yeah, maybe just another point that uh, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and um, I did uh, something below you might not even know is I was actually an ostrich farmer in the US and in Canada for three years right. in my young days. So I was driving around ostriches in the back of a a truck, um, we had a place in Ocala and I had a quarantine station in Chicago. So going from ostriches to the real estate industry. Wow, um, that's quite the story. <laughs> yeah, no, um, certainly a lovely country that you guys have. Um, yeah, from, from a South Africa point of view, we, I must be honest with you, that first, um, you know, three weeks of, of lockdown, um, it, was a, it was a moment where I reflected and thought a lot about 2008. Um, it was particularly a tough period of time for, for us in South Africa and obviously for property across the world. Spoke to a lot of people around me and, and there was a feeling that this could be worse than back then. You know, so I, I often tell my people we must think back how we felt in the first three weeks of this lockdown in South Africa. We had a, a full lockdown for 60 days. And what that means you know, in real estate South Africa, and unfortunately we have a, what we call a deeds office where all the deals get registered, but this deeds office was manual. So um, it was not on an electronic system, which means every single transaction that built up to the end of March for the past four months prior to that, it hasn't registered and no money has flown, couldn't register. So not only did all our agents, which about 15,000 of them got paid for, for 60 days, not a single deal of their pipeline got paid. They couldn't do any new deals. Uh, our company didn't get any income, any of our companies, the ones from the banks, from mortgages, the, obviously the real estate ones, and you know we have a, a, a big staff contingent to look after. So you sit there as a leader and you say, wow, you know, been through 2008, um, barely made it through and here we are again and it came out of the blue so um yeah a lot of lessons in that i think you know one must always stay calm it, it was complex uh, you know our business we started as a core business doing mortgages but then we quickly uh, realized we have to move down the value chain so we um you know we love this home buyer's journey um, when someone stays in a house and there's a life event happening to them and they make a decision to either buy or sell um, you know, then potentially go onto a portal, um, you know, and then eventually a lead potentially ends up with an estate agent or a realtor, as you call it. And then there's a mortgage involved in some of them. And then there's insurance. I mean, you all know that old home journey. So we've, our holding company have invested in businesses across that value chain. So we kind of saw this thing hit, you know, from the portal that we've invested in to the real estate uh, businesses we've invested in, all our partners, the developers, um, our insurance business, suddenly we started getting uh, retrenchment claims, you know, something we never really considered to be big. Uh, so we had to start doing modeling to understand how does this potentially affect our business, um, you know, down to home services, et cetera. Um, and, and the one thing that I, that I will always keep with me is a, is a book that I've, I've read and that I, you know, I really firmly believe in trying to manage, uh, you know, a complex business and it's called Four Disciplines of Execution. And Mike spoke, uh, you know, I see Mike have read that as well. It's my favorite book. And if you own a business and you, 
you know, we all have dreams, whether you own a business or whether you want to be the top realtor in your area. But so many dreams stay dreams because people cannot execute well. And this book really teaches you to execute in a very simple way. Uh, and yeah, for those of you that haven't read that book, I would, I would urge you to do that. It will be time well spent. It's a book, uh, it's by Chris McChesney and Sean Covey, uh, The Four Disciplines of Execution. So we implemented that. We've had it in our business before, but we really thought around the COVID area, we actually said ourselves, it talks about creating a wildly important goal and then saying, what are the two or three battles we can fight to win this war? And uh, you know, those three battles, you cannot focus on more than three things at, at any time. So whatever it is, if I wanna lose weight, I know I have to do two things. The, the one battle is I need to start exercising. And the second battle is I must start eating less or better. It's as simple as that. And now you must just measure that. So whatever you want to do in life, um, you know, that's the simplicity of how the book teaches you. Um, and in all our businesses, we got that implemented and we literally on a scorecard once a week looked where we are or where we were in the process. And yeah, that helped us tremendously. It just made it all visible and everybody knew what to focus on. And I think all of us know, you know, you show us, uh, you know, if you, if you look at a successful person, look at their diary, and see what are the activities, the one or two activities they're busy with every day. And I can tell you who's successful and who's not. It's as simple as that. Uh, and some, sometimes it's just back to basics. So we try to control the things we could. And we were incredibly, uh, you know, as I said, the first three months, I, I really thought we were not going to make it, but the people stayed positive. And we were so fortunate to get through this, really blessed because there's so many industries that are not. Um, and yeah, we, at the moment, our business for the last two or three months have been flying. And then I think you got to pivot out of that situation where you're in this dark moment to, um, to also say, but what are the opportunities in this? And, and, and yep. both Stefan and Mike spoke about that. And man, I want to say to you, I've, I've been in this for 20 years now. I have never been this excited about my industry, my business, and you know where we're heading. Um, and despite COVID, because um, we don't have much control over that, but we have control over the things that we see around us and the things that we can can use to to better ourselves and our business and our people. So um, no, I I think from that point of view, um, lots of lessons for me personally. Um, I don't think you can ever stop learning. Eh? That's for sure. And and I really, I mean, you you you've got a you you're in the real estate world. That whole value chain, that whole that whole yeah you know, purchase life cycle of people, and 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 you deal with a lot of realtors and estate agents in in in. Well, pretty much everywhere. What are the things that stand out as those who've made it? Because a lot of them didn't make it. A lot of them didn't make it through the the, the dip. And I mean, you've got a very very beautiful high level view of so many businesses. What, what made them make it through this crisis? Again, I, I think Mike spoke to that a little bit. I think you have to have a very clear strategy and a vision. You know, and there's so many different. Uh, real estate business is focusing on different things. So first of all, you know, you need to know what your strategy is. You need to know who's your customer. So a lot of, uh, you know, these real estate businesses focusing on a broker and they've got a broker model. You've got real estate businesses that are fo focusing on the individual uh, realtor. You've got real estate businesses fo focusing on the seller. So that's their main customer. Some of them are fo focusing on buyers, Tenants, landlords, we can go on. So I think you need to clearly know what is your, who's your main customer and what is your value proposition for that customer. And we've seen those that are good at that with strong value propositions and great execution come through this very strongly. Um, we've seen this, this, this uh, cut in costs. Certainly, I think you know, you know, the, the successful real estate businesses will have to be a lot leaner. There's a lot of pressure you know, on, 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 on margin, you know, the splits as we call it in South Africa. Um, and there's also pressure from a customer point of view to saying, you know, what am I paying for? You know, in South Africa, we don't have a buyer and a seller's agent separately. You know, an agent a lot of times represents the buyer and the seller. You know, and then our commission, average commission here is 5%. I think in your case, it's 3% on each side um, with some pressure on some of the sides coming down. We have the same year. I always say, you know, some of people ask me, what, so who's going to win the race at the end of the day? And a lot of people talk about disruption. And I, I, I think I attended one of the Inman conferences uh, and you know, a guy stood up and said, um, you know, the disruption, as they call it, is going to come from a company that offers a superior experience at a superior price. And I want to adjust it a bit. 
and, and say it's not necessarily disruption, but I think success is going to come from a company or an individual that offers us a superior experience at a superior price. And it's not so much about the price because people are prepared to pay for value. We've seen it all along. You know, there are people that are prepared to pay five, six percent because we're dealing with their biggest asset. But it's the value you add. And I firmly believe an agent or a top realtor will stay central to the transaction. Doesn't matter how much technology is coming. As long as you have a toolkit and you use technology to your benefit, I think you could add tremendous value to whether it's a tenant, a landlord, a buyer or a seller. You know, and there's, therein lies the opportunity. We can become more efficient through technology. We can do more deals. Uh, we mustn't see that as a, as a potential risk and, and, and run away from that. Rather embrace it. And I mean, how have we seen that happen in, um, in other businesses around the world? I mean, look at the technology business, how they've just excelled. And I personally, I don't see any of that turning around. I mean, even in the adoption just in our business to the, to the technology platforms, I mean, PayPro. You know, we have um, all our customers that were on that were so thankful, 60 days they could trade, that they could do whatever they wanted from home, where some of our guys were not on there and they, their business was shut down. So, yeah, I just, I think technology is a, is a great enabler. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I love that. Success from, comes from a company that provides superior product, a superior service at a superior price. It's not just about being average and giving value. It's about being better. Now, now the, the, the next person I wanna, I wanna introduce is, is Matty Basie, who, who probably almost, I set her up to almost be the counterbalance of all of this because Stefan comes to us and says, you know what, you, 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 you gotta look forward, you gotta do you know, the things that are right. And, and Mike comes and he says, look, I've made some hard choices and I, but, but I've stuck with it, I'm communicated and I'm moving forward, I've got a vision. And, and, and Larry comes and he says, you know, what's really powerful for this business is you've got to keep your vision. You've got to, you've got to keep looking at it. You can't just look down, you've got to look forward and you've got to focus on being superior. Um, which is, which is all, all three of those messages are interesting because in the middle of a global pandemic, what people often do is they look in front of them and they just forget about looking forward. So it's beautiful forward looking. But I almost want to set up Matty slightly to look back and say, while we're doing all of that and focusing either on the pandemic in front of us and all the business, what, we, what we've seen, just a little bit that we've seen, is that people often forget to look back and say, I've still got obligations. I still have to make sure that my business is run properly and that my business is run safely. And I'm not putting my business at risk in the process by either just focusing on this horrendous thing that I need to do with or trying to figure out how to survive it. So Matthew, if I can just introduce you with that and say, you, you, you've seen the best and the worst of real estate. You've seen where it goes really right and you've seen where it goes really wrong. In your view, what are the risks for a business that takes their eye off the ball? Well, I will tell you that, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can, beautifully, okay. thank you. I will tell you that I, I understand why you put me at the last end, everybody was, inordinately positive, especially well my, it was like from such a long line of real estate uh, icons, it's incredible. And now he has his daughter coming up who's going to take over the whole thing. So I think that's awesome. But knowing that being last, I am, a, um, this is risk management, what I'm talking about, yeah. how you have to manage your risk so that you continue to operate safely and you can, uh, your, your bottom line will continue to rise. Okay. Understand I'm speaking from the state of Florida because that's what I'm most accustomed to. However, I do belong to an association um, called Arello, which is the, um, uh, an association of real estate license law officials. So Arello has every, I know it has South Africa that belongs, has all the jurisdictions that have any type of licensing. And when we get together, we exchange ideas to who, how can we do it better and yet allow the licensees to make their, their to continue their careers and make money. Know that um, rules can be different uh, in the different jurisdiction, but, um, Risk management is what it is. You, it's all over the world. And you, what happens is you are ultimately entrusted, no matter who you are, with someone else's money. And at that point in time, the minute you are entrusted with their money, you assume liability and responsibility for your client's money. Now, many of us, you know, I, I'm sure in the large businesses, the large corporations, large offices, they have someone handling this. Um, 
for those in smaller offices, I have a small office and we have somebody handling it. Um, and so what happens is uh, you need to know exactly what the law is in your jurisdiction as to how you handle that money. I would say almost 95% of the jurisdictions say that they will audit at any time. I know in the state of Florida, they can knock on the door of your office and say, I wanna see your escrow account. And if you're doing property management, I need to see that also. Property management is interesting because um, there's a lot of difficulties there because a lot of times, especially in, in some of these uh, large jurisdictions, Florida, for example, we have a lot of international clients and they don't, they come in, they will purchase real estate and they will want somebody to manage it. Um, we have property management uh, companies that will manage the property for the, the uh, a client and um, they will get a salary, they will get a stipend of some, of some type, uh, whatever has been agreed upon. The bigger problem is that in the state of Florida, you've got to have a real estate license in order to manage, uh, do, have, do property management. And that is because you come under the rule of 475, which is our license law. Many of the jurisdictions have the same laws that will say you have to be licensed or have some type of jurisdictional uh, approval in order to run a property management company. Now, if you've got your own real estate and you're running it yourself, you don't need a license, that's obvious. But most of the time in larger jurisdictions, when you have people coming in from uh, other countries, they will want you as the broker or the one that sold them that property, can you tell me who can manage it? And most brokers will wanna manage that or have a department that will handle it because that does create income for them. The bigger problem exists that in, in some instances, a medium size, a large office, it doesn't matter what it is, small, medium, or large, you can have difficulties there where let's say um, you're not doing so well in your, um, in your sales, uh, say we're in the middle of a pandemic, you haven't had many sales and you've got bills to pay. And they're sitting in your property management account is multiple dollars that you're in trust for your client um, there is first and last month's rents, maybe there is uh, uh, dollars for repairs, etc. And it's a goodly amount and you look over and say, well, I'll just borrow it and I'll put it back. Um, and, and that, of course, is a violation of license law in the state of Florida. And I know in most jurisdictions, it could be also. Uh, and so what happens is when you do that, uh, you need to there should be some form of reconciliation. I, uh, we have our, our escrow account, which holds our sales uh, deposits. It, they get reconciled every month um, because I'm always afraid somebody's going to come in and say, let me see your books. Because <laughs> when I sat on the real estate commission for eight years, we had a lot of the, the biggest problems we had were with management companies that were siphoning off money thinking, well, I'm going to pay it back. Uh, and a lot of times they get caught in the middle and they haven't had a chance to pay it back. Um, so in, 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 when the deposits go in, they should have a property management agreement if a large company is going to handle their client's dollars and manage their company. And the client should be sent a um, reconciliation form for how much money they have if something has gone out of it. Uh, and what it was for, other uh, bills for, for handling the property. Um, a, sometimes you have a lot now when you people wire money in and out, you have wire fees uh, and that has to be taken into account. And unless you have in your agreement that your client pays for wire fees, you're stuck with them. So you need to sit down with somebody or uh, develop a property management uh, account that, and you know exactly what you're getting into because in that respect, you can lose an inordinate amount of problems. Um, you can lose you can lose your license, you know, and you can also um, be sued um, for uh, uh, um, for damages and also a possible uh, convictions in a court of law because you misused dollars that were in your safekeeping. Um, one interesting aspect, and and there is no positive sometimes for this pandemic. But um, 
one positive is because the pandemic has been so tough on business, many of the, and I'm not speaking for all jurisdictions, I know from the state of Florida, that a lot of the auditing hasn't been done because they don't send auditors out anymore because they're afraid of the virus or there's too much going on. So at least they've, we, we've gotten a cushion for auditing. Uh, and um, uh, But still, the, when the auditors come in, in most jurisdictions, they want to see all your, all your pending files, all your, uh, if you're holding escrow, uh, and how much is in your, and they want to see your escrow account. They'll even sit there, and I've even had them sit there and call my bank and say, you know, does she have this much in there? <laughs> wow. Sure, because uh, state of Florida, we have, you know, about, oh, I want to say maybe, uh, geez, uh, 200,000 licensees close. So that generates a lot of difficulties and so on, especially if you don't follow the law. So again, when you, when you are for risk management, when you are handling anyone's, some, one of your client's money, whether it be for property management, you need to reconcile or your escrow account, you need to do the same thing. You need to be very careful down to the penny because they will nail you on it. Um, I, I have been through many audits myself and never had a problem, thank God. But um, I, I, you know, I have heard, I've seen cases where uh, the last time I sat on probable cause, um, a gentleman had taken a lot of money out of his uh, uh, his property management account to pay his bills, and the you know of course the owner was out of country and never asked for any type of reconciliation until the owner came in one day and said. I, I think you you know you have X amount of my dollars, and the guy said, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. didn't have a real good answer. So from that point on, they went into litigation, et cetera. Um, and the property manager, the broker lost his license. And in the state of Florida, you have to have a broker's license in order to do property management. You just can't have, unless again, it is your own dollars. So so, so, so Manny, I mean, that, that, that brings me beautifully back to what Stefan started with, is that he said, you know, in a tough time, your integrity is what counts. Yes. Um, because sticking the course, and now you said something about there being this, you know, people might perceive that there's an audit cushion, that no one's going to knock on my door and ask me for the money. Um, right. But that risk doesn't go away, right? No, you, you've always got inherent risk when you're dealing with someone else's money. So you have to be extraordinarily careful. Um, I, I have absorbed more $15 wire fees than is imaginable because I, I, you know, I sell real estate, you know, Mike runs a huge business uh, and as, as does Rudy, um, we have a very small office and primarily the reason is we like selling. I, I don't want to manage, um, I, I, you know, I want to go out there and sell and that's what I do. So, but still I need to. There's if, a lot more money in selling than there is in management. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're right there, Mike. <laughs> so I, it's, it's, you know, it's, um, but still I, I handle the risk management in the office. You know, I make sure we are in compliance because I've seen what can happen to people, you know, and that, and, and, you know, sometimes you're dealing with someone that, that's the only money they have and it's a necessary thing. And it, it really, um, it, in, and um, when I sat on the commission, they called me escrow. Uh, I was an escrow, I, I miss escrow because if anybody messed up with their escrow account, I, I would try to take their license. Hey, yeah. so, so Matthew, we've got a question from, from Joe Ballerino um, uh, that says, does a company or person, not the owner, need a license to just manage the financial aspects of a rental in Florida or is the license only needed to handle creating leases? I'm sorry, say again. Is, is, so, so, so Joe's asking, do you, do you need a license if you're only managing the financial affairs or do you need a license if you're only managing the creating of leases? So some people just go and say, I'll find your tenant, we'll do the lease. I, I, I don't, need a license I, I, I'm, you know what, I, I'm not, I think, I'm not sure about writing a lease, but I think if you're going to, if you're handling leasing in your real estate company, then you've got to have a broker's license. Um yeah. And so that would, I assume, come under leasing, unless, again, you're doing your own property. If you're leasing your own property, or if somebody says, can you lease something for me, and you're not licensed, you can get a lease form. You can go to the, the, the you know, a, the corner store 
and they have, you know, many of these stationery stores have, I remember long ago that you could pick up a lease copy there. Uh, you know, our leases in the state of Florida are, are promulgated by um, Florida Association of Realtors uh, with the guidance of the Florida Real Estate Commission to make sure we uh, are applicable to the law. So, I mean, just writing a lease, I, anybody I think can write a lease. I mean, I can write one on paper without being licensed, but because I am licensed, now it becomes, and I write a lease, now I'm responsible for what I'm putting on the paper. At least yes, that's how yes. I believe. Well, we are, we have, we are running out of time. So I want to just pull this together. I, I, I'm sitting here and I, I, I keep on thinking we, we're in this pandemic and everyone is just looking, you know, doom and gloom and the numbers just go up. And then I, I, I listen to everyone here and I'm just really, really excited. And before I summarize, I just, I just want to talk a little bit about what we, what we do. My two seconds, my two slides on paper. So you just understand where we're coming from. And then I just want to pull it all together. So just um, on what paper is, um, paper is uh, a, a platform, it's a trust account platform that integrates banking, property management and accounting. It's like, imagine you had a bank that developed a product for you as a property manager that does what you wanted to do, to not give you transactions by date range, but transactions filtered by property. It doesn't expect you to make payments, but makes the payments um, for you. Um, and, and literally what makes us very different is that we sort of sit between you and the financial world. Um, a lot of what goes wrong, I mean, back to what you said, is, is it's about keeping your trust accounts going, about making sure the payments there. So Payprop is this closed account that sits outside of your business that doesn't allow you to fund your own business from it, that doesn't allow you to commingle the funds or convert the funds into something that it shouldn't be. It is a sealed unit that sits outside of your business and takes all this chaos of checks and ACHs and payments, orders it, and automatically pushes it out to where it should be. Um, but more beautifully, it actually accounts for it as it happens. So it really helps you keep that obligation going and, and, and so that your, your, your level of risk is substantially lower. And we do this for thousands of people across the world. I mean, we process billions of dollars in a year. Um, but we're not software. We're not a piece of software that you have to drive or you have to put figures in or you have to deal with. Um, you put your payment rules in and the machine runs it. So it's an automated transaction platform for straight through financial processing. And that's just really who we are. It's got a complicated account structure behind it that has all your escrow accounts in it and allows you to pay in and out. But if you wanna know more about it, you know where to find us, um, we're easy to find. I, I wanna say, before I say thank you to everyone, I just wanna pull it all together. I mean, I, I was amazed. I really, I, I was amazed by what we heard today because it's so different to what I thought we'd hear. Um, from the level of optimism we got from people from like Stefan that reminds us, you know, we're, we're athletes and farmers and soldiers and we need to keep that going in our business to people like Mike that tell us all about, you know, you've got a responsibility in your business. And Mike, I was amazed at the number of things you did in your business in the short period of time. People think, you know, COVID has been about sitting in your home and Zoom conferencing and just, you know, wearing pants when it's optional. And you, you've fundamentally transformed your business in the last six months. I mean, that's, that's how you use time, right? And then to Rudy, who's kept it together with a complicated business, had to make hard decisions, um, but keep it all going in track. Um, that, that's amazing how you've actually thrived in all of that from everything from the entire home buyer's journey. And then to Matthew reminding us that, you know, it's all, it's all good that we get out of this pandemic thinking that we're all getting out of, you know, being like Mike and planning in 2021, but you've got to keep your eye on the ball. You've got to keep the money safe. The temptation of thinking people aren't looking because they can't knock on the door is something you can't ignore. You've got to keep your business safe. And I want to, uh, I really want to go back to where we started. You know, it's about, you've trained for this all your life. You've built your business, you've invested in your business, but it's about sticking to the integrity of your vision, but also the integrity of how you run your business. And you can't take your eye off that financial ball. You can't, you simply can't. If you need help with it, you know where to get us. Um, and I want to thank all the contributors. I want to thank everyone for your time. It's been lovely. We're honored to have such amazing experience just shared so freely. It's been amazing. We will make this available to people. Um, the video will be available and uh, the transcripts, not the transcripts, the video will be available and we'll, we'll put a little summary together of what we had today. But I want to thank everyone for coming here. It's been absolutely tremendous. Um, thank you so much. It's been incredible. Thank you. Thank you for your time, everyone.